Hi, guys. I'm Tara Lipinski. And this is Todd Kapastashi. And you're listening to the 17th episode of Unexpecting. 17. I know. When do we actually call it season two? <laughs> or when do we just stop? Like, I don't do podcast number episodes. So many things about this podcast we process no that we just doing. kind of winged. I don't think podcasts that kind of just keep going into perpetuity, like number the episodes. Should, should that be us, though? We're just like, this is the 2,300. <laughs> <Episode> <laughs> yeah, I think we could keep it feels for some reason for me, it feels like uh, we've accomplished something as we just rack up these things. Yeah. If exciting. they're not. You know what else we haven't talked about is why <laughs> why we've named all the podcast titles like in that Friends. If anyone knows not you know 90 sitcoms like Friends used to name all their episodes like the one I think the one when they used to do like the one when Chandler and Rachel get right. married or the one when whatever and they did 10 8 seasons of that and for whatever reason when we started naming these it just felt like a fun it felt it felt like a way to make such a serious topic lighter like inform the listener maybe that we were going to you know not take any of this lightly but add was, humor and be some humor and a little bit of lightness that's <laughs> needed so. i feel like it worked perfectly and todd you are a huge friends fan well no i'm not a huge oh, friends fan you're not no i mean I come down and it's in the background while you're working. <laughs> I was actually not a Friends fan at all. Like growing up in the '90s, I was. I love Seinfeld. I still love Seinfeld. That's like my favorite sitcom of all time. But my friend Kyle, you obviously yes. know Kyle. He's for some reason he's like obsessed with Friends, and I used to make fun of him. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna like watch the series through. This was like a couple of years ago, and it is a great show. I understand and you've why watched people it, love it a million times over, and now you started again because I think. Well, I put it the when sad I'm, news of. Of Matthew Perry. Well, yeah. So Matthew, obviously Matthew Perry passed away and I worked out in my office and there was a TV. So a lot of times just to have some noise in the background, I'll throw on anything like uh -huh. an old series and just have it on. So after the Matthew Perry news, I kind of just as an homage to him, yeah. threw it on. He was, he's awesome in that show. I know. But what is, I know. What is now it makes thing? me sad. <laughs> I, know. I get very upset. Another strange thing about me. Obviously I have no connection to Matthew Perry, never met him, but I get very upset, obviously. I think so many people do because it was, you know, I grew up with friends, but at a certain point you came in one day and you're like, you have to stop reading about Matthew Perry. I was so yeah, upset. Yeah, you got weirdly kind of yeah. intrigued by the whole, I know. His, his struggles and then it seemed like he cleaned himself up. Yeah, and, I know. It's um, just, it was, oh. Sad. Okay, moving yeah. on. Well, no, no. Now to more sad Well, subjects. I don't want to move on. I actually have another comment about that. <laughs> oh, no. you do? Well, I was driving home. I don't, this is such a dumb comment, but I was driving home the other day and he lived, I guess, like I didn't in our know area. this, like kind of in our area. And it just like struck me that as I was driving home and looking up like those sorts of people like live up in the hills and these like big expansive right. kind of like properties. And I remember just kind of looking up there and being like, that happened like five minutes from, from, I know. from where we are. I know, it's just a weird, that's surreal what, thing. Uh, yeah, it upsets me when I actually, I go through the thoughts like, what was I doing at that minute? And, you know, oh. Yeah, or, you know, we very well could have seen the ambulances drive right, by our house right. or whatever it was. So oh, we have a visitor, crazy. guys. Oh, hey, Sullivan. Sullivan just likes to, we have decided not to, we were blocking him out for the first 15 episodes and... We've just, it's like, a free for all now. He like knows where not to be though, which frustrates me. He knows he, <laughs> he could lay anywhere not else. Know this. He knows that this is a bad spot he for him. This dog does not. Look at him. He knows that I don't want him here, and he finds the place. Eventually, well, he'll like go. You cute in your fall scarf, Sullivan. I think you just want to make an appearance. He'll go and lay over there for a while in a second, but it just takes it. He like knows we're filming. <laughs> just ignore him. <laughs> um, one other thing from the last time we recorded a podcast, I think, or maybe not, but we didn't talk about it, is it was Halloween. Yes. Georgie's first Halloween. It was so cute. It was such a it was such a fun day. I was and I don't know if this is what parenthood might be like. And again, I think we should just talk quickly when we did this last episode. But, you know, we are going to continue to talk about infertility and talk about we have exciting news we'll we'll tell you guys later about where we think this podcast is going with other people's stories and that will be part of our podcast but whenever we do talk about Georgie whether it's in the beginning or at any point and maybe we don't every episode but if we do um I just always want to to give that warning that 
you can skip ahead during these these parts. But back to Halloween, it was very exciting because I didn't realize how I was going to feel during a holiday with a new child in our home. And what do you mean I, you didn't know how you were going to feel? Well, you know. I knew how you were going to feel. You did. Giddy and. Well, I love holidays, guys. I have a <laughs> Overdoing sickness. it and stressing me out about making sure we do every little thing to maximize Georgie's <laughs> first Halloween. I have a sickness <laughs> about holidays, guys. It is. It's. I have an illness. I love holidays holidays so much that I think about them for months in advance. We're coming up on the best season of the year, just, you know, Thanksgiving rolling right into Christmas and New Year's. And I go big, but it was always for myself. So I didn't know how it was going to feel with a child in the house. And I think so many parents, you hear them talk about, oh, we, it, it's even better. Or you relive some of these moments or there's this childlike innocence, obviously, in the atmosphere. And I just wondered what that would feel like. And it really does. I was so pumped. I felt like I was going out to trick or treat or something as a kid. Like that same giddiness was in me. And I woke up so early. It was like, it, I felt like a five-year-old on Christmas day because I had two outfits for her with well, the little one, Dorothy one outfit. One I had lobbied for, which was Dorothy. Right. We had had a conversation about the skating thing it's actually funny it's like not uh, you know something we need to like discuss as like an argument but at some <laughs> but point we do that at here. some point we need do need to discuss like the pressure of this poor child like todd there is no to pressure skate. she never needs her to first, figure skate ever. literally four weeks or whatever it is into her life she's wearing she's, your olympic it's a costume, costume. she's 30 days old. Yeah, and she's going to look back at those pictures and be uh, have instant anxiety for not achieving. <laughs> what no, you she did. was just dressing up as her mom. It was cool though, and the person, I don't know if you want to shout them out who made it. Oh, Brad Griffiths. He is so this was okay. So, let's talk about this. I um I thought it was going to be a, a great idea because it was I mean she's a newborn and we had these crochet skates that someone gave me at our shower, which were just the cutest things, how I never even thought to, to look online for them. But they they gave them to me. And this is the only time really that she'll be able to quote unquote wear skates. You know, next, next year, we're not going to put her in real skates. And also maybe when she's a certain age, obviously she picks what she wants to be for Halloween. So I just thought this was the perfect well, I'm gonna timing. I'm going to hold you to that. Of course. What she do you think? Picks. She's going to be a figure skater? No, I don't. I'm just saying you were going to pick. No, I want her to choose. Which when she obviously don't didn't you choose your own costumes? No, oh well, we have. I was Snow White for sixteen we years. Have, just you know kidding, this. Guys. We have because my parents were actually here for you know the first yeah. little while after we had Georgie, and my mom was telling funny stories about how awful my costumes were because like, you know, we, I didn't have a ton of money growing up and my mom kind of tried to make them. And I have pictures of some bad Halloween costumes. Like the whole class would have these elaborate, nice ones. And I'd be like, yeah, I think I saw one. It was, it was a little <laughs> was rough. Bad. Like she would like mix and match from the previous years. So if I was like, like a cowboy one year, I'd be the next year I'd be like, a warden who wore cowboy boots or something. <laughs> <laughs> be like, I remember because she showed me a picture recently and I was like, why am I wearing cowboy boots? And she's like, oh, you were a cowboy the previous year. I'm like, oh, okay. I got Great. It. <laughs> no, but funny story when I was a kid, did I ever tell you this? I don't know if I did. I loved Snow White, okay? And I wanted to be Snow White every year. So I was Snow White for like four to five years, I think. Um, so anyway, yes, this was the year that we get to to just have fun and she'd be able to wear these skates, which I just thought was to die for. Um, and Brad Griffiths, he, he makes incredible costumes. Um, and he made the replica of my Olympic outfit. It was kind of outfit. just by chance, right? Because he was at one of the skating competitions well, you were Johnny, at? Well, Johnny, oh, okay. when we were at Skate America and Johnny was like, this is this is it. This is this is what you're gonna do, Uncle Johnny. Was yeah, I'll in blame charge. him for that. Yeah. If she grows up with this like <laughs> horrible no. anxiety. I mean, thinking about that though, I'm sure people wonder what our thoughts are about skating. I mean, obviously, skating is is such a passion of mine and um, my life for so long and continues to be. But I truly 
I don't know. I don't know if Georgie. I, I will definitely take her to the rink just for fun, or if she asks. Yeah, I think those. But things. I would never. I I never foresee her ever skating. Isn't that strange? Because I do know there are Olympians that go on to have children that either do their sport or become Olympians as well, which is insane. But I don't. I don't ever picture a life where Georgie is a figure skater. Yeah. I mean, I think she'll choose. I mean, those things what figure them out. What if she wants to, though? Yeah, then she will. And then if she's great, then oh, she'll stick with man. it. If not, maybe she'll... It's a hard life, Georgie girl. Yeah. One other thing that I wanted to ask you about is... And the, I think part of this podcast that's been so fun... I know this sounds like... I don't know what this sounds like, but it, it's... It's awesome to hear you like read me feedback, you mm -hmm, know, because we mm -hmm. have put a lot of work into this. Like we put ourselves out there, even me, like you're obviously you should deserve all this credit. You're a public figure. People didn't know that this was going on. You came out and talked about it. But even for me, it's like I'm not a public figure at all. I'm just some dude and I'm on this podcast like crying and talking about my sperm and our <laughs> sex life. So it's like I'm putting myself out there in right. a way and to hear people you know, give you, give us such positive feedback, like feels really good. It makes it in a way, sadly, it does make it feel worth it. You right. know, I know the bigger picture is that we just right. want to help people right. and, you know, get, get these conversations right. more out there. But I would say, and you tell me 99.9999% of the feedback has been so positive. I feel like you've read me a couple that have just been I mean, literally like one or two <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, <what? yeah. laughs> that have sort of insinuated that look i this is my take is that no matter who you are you have no obligation to dedicate your life to anything if you go through a trauma if you survive cancer that you are now not obligated to dedicate the rest of your life to curing cancer to advocating for cancer to dumping your half your salary right. into curing cancer if you survive that trauma you get to decide you can never talk about it the rest of your life, never advocate for it, right. never spend a dime on it. And that's that's totally fine. And a lot of people do that with whatever trauma they go through. They endure it and they move on with their lives. And I think the comment that I'm referring to is this idea that, oh, Tara, you need to now essentially give up your life, your career, and all of your money to now just figure out fertility which the thing is with this podcast i feel like we've endlessly prefaced so much yes as we should have it's like we're we are so, we are lucky so privileged to be able to for being able to afford these yes. things and but that doesn't also like dictate what we're gonna do for the rest of our life well i was gonna, in... yes that but also <laughs> it doesn't like preclude us from like being affected by the trauma well yeah no <laughs> too. no i mean that's so what it's it, all of that stuff. well i i think about that like we are so privileged for even having the opportunity right but along with that opportunity of continuing IVF and going through more cycles, I added, you know, it was like suitcase after suitcase of trauma and baggage that I added because we had that, that opportunity too, you know? So it's like very difficult um, for me to wrap my head around the, there, there's two different things, right? We're privileged, but like you said, we still experienced all of this grief and trauma. But to your point about this comment, it was it was interesting to me because obviously anyone who's in this community, I feel, I feel, I mean, you see it. I just will cry. I mean, I'm an emotional person, but I read these stories every day and these messages and cry. It's it's so on the surface for me because it's part of our life. And um, I feel so much compassion and, and empathy towards anyone on this journey, whether their journey is different or not. There's so many different journeys in in, in infertility. Um, but but yes, the, the funny thing about it is, and you can attest to this, I have this great urge inside, this passion to make a difference in this world. I love doing what we're doing with the podcast, but you see what I'm doing with the rest of my days. I am I am just literally cold calling people and companies and asking for fertility grants and asking for giveaways. And yeah, but the point is that you don't have to do that. I know. <laughs> if you don't and want to, I feel like you're almost like defending yourself, which is the point I was trying to make is you don't like you are doing a bunch this of amazing things. This is why I love things, you. You always but you don't remind have to. me. <laughs> right. I know. And I don't, but, well, the, and, uh, but the ironic thing is, is 
I want to. So when you get a message like that of what else are you going to do for us, it's sort of like, well, this feels ironic because I'm spending my days doing this. And I don't, yeah. like you said, I don't necessarily have to take up this cause, but I want to so badly. And yeah. then also, I don't think people remember, but even when we're talking about it, it, it it's hard for me to go back to these emotions. It's hard for me to remember our life and also remember what I will constantly grieve for the rest of my life. Yeah. You know, we lost, I, I don't know if we ever really mentioned it. We lost four babies. We lost three girls and a boy. And then we lost two more girls in, you know, in, in a failed retrieval or failed transfers. I mean, we have all these potential babies that, Every day I think about what did I say to you last night? I I look at Georgie and I and I see her becoming a person and I just it's hard for me not to think back to all those embryos, all those miscarriages. Who were they? Yeah, like what, what would they, they going like? What would they yeah. have looked like? What would they have been? What would their personality would they be doing these cute little things and it's hard. You know, this is something that we live with for the rest of our our lives. Yeah, I think it's hard. I think my, like people who I know in my family and friends who are like in the LGBTQ community have said to me, you know, one thing we deal with is like the infighting within groups. It's like you get into these like inter group right. identity, inner identity, like bickering and fighting. And it's so like counterproductive to the ultimate goal. And s some of the comments I feel like I've seen t like directed towards you from fertility people, like that's what they're doing. It's sort of like, well, you're wasting your time taking down someone who really is, I mean, I, I, I'm a sort of innocent bystander yeah. in all this. Like I, I will tell everyone, like you are doing this for right. good reasons. We did this for good reason. Cause I think I even saw like one comment on like Apple reviews that sort of said, well, I felt deceived because they ended up having a baby. And it's like, right. what are you, what do you mean deceived? Right. Like we started this way before a surrogate, surrogate was pregnant. So like our surrogate could have miscarried or the baby could or, have been stillborn. So well, I, I just don't sometimes, understand. You know, you told me about that comment and I always think, what if that person went back, you know, cause they posted it at whatever point in our journey when we were, were pregnant with the surrogate. What if they went back two weeks later to an episode we did cause we were trying to do them in present time. And we said, oh my goodness, we lost the baby or we had a stillbirth yeah. or we, you know, would I, they have been happy. Would, <laughs> would, they have, yeah. would the podcast have been more fulfilling for them if we would have ended in tragedy? You right. Know? And it, and that's hard to wrap your mind around. And I think this is actually, I could go on this conversation and I'm sure there's so many people because I, I've actually spoken with them, you know, through, <laughs> through the DM system now that has become like a whole new life for me, but, um, pregnancy after loss. And I think a lot of, you know, again, in the infertility world, some people may just go through hell to to get pregnant or go through IVF issues and some may not experience loss others may so the people that haven't I think they need to understand that these journeys pregnancy after loss just because you see a positive pregnancy test I mean quote unquote I, I had a successful I had four successful quote unquote successful pregnancies we don't have a baby I would have much rather never seen that positive test to then feel that pain in weeks of limbo. And at what point do you then say this is successful or we reach success? Because we didn't reach success until we had a healthy baby in our arms. And there are so many people that show up at 39 weeks or 38 weeks and they don't go home with a baby. Yeah. So it's like just opening your mind to think about what a journey could look like for pregnancy yeah. after loss. I will say though, you're going to hate that I'm saying this, but you know me, I'm always like the contrarian or playing yeah. you know, devil's advocate. Like, I, I don't think anyone was deceived. I do get the feeling though, knowing like how you felt through your journey, even this like idea of you would never want to like not see success. But when we saw some people have, we said this on the podcast, yeah. when we saw some people have success, we'd be like, oh, fuck them. Or like, oh, like not that we weren't happy for right. like our friends or, or like whatever it was. But there is this feeling when you're so down and struggling in infertility and you do see success. Of course, everyone wants to dig down deep and be like, I'm a good person. Right. I want to see other oh, people that's happy. To yeah. That's but I guess my point is totally with that one feel. person, they may have felt like, gosh, I'm connecting with these two people so much. They're like in it. Like 
they're talking right. as if it's never going to happen right. for them. And now now it, it did happen for them right. as I was listening and watching. And that like hurts. I, I do get that. Oh, actually. I get that. Yeah. I get that completely. I mean, we talked so much about that on the podcast. I think for me, the part that is is triggering <laughs> again, you know, I'm triggered by the comment because I'm the one that's gone through so much loss through pregnancy. So, you know, at that point, we did not have a baby, yeah. you know, so I, I was at home having anxiety attacks about what was going to happen to us or what was next. Yeah, I mean, loss. all of these episodes were filmed. Like, what was the one where 15, I guess we brought on Georgie. Georgie. I think the one 13, before the one before is when the that first was, 13, we obviously, did, you know, didn't have Georgie. Right. So, you know, in varying degrees of how long right. ago the other ones were. But, you know, the other thing I want to say, too, and take this criticism like off you and take responsibility for it. Not that I need to, right. but the idea that like there were cliffhangers in these things and we were kind of telling a mystery, like looking back, I'm glad that we did that for the storytelling purposes. I, I think people really did connect with they did, yeah. because of they some of the humor it. we infused, which again, probably not appropriate for the topic, but I think it helped people kind of digest, relate, this. Yeah, digest the topic and relate to us and, and compare it to their journeys. And then this idea that it was easily digestible in the sense of episode one, we're talking about these things and this miscarriage miscar yeah. happened. And then what's going to happen in the second episode? Well, we'll, t we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit at the end and kind of just like cut. I would always just cut off your answer. Like right. that, that was me. Like I'm a documentary filmmaker. I love telling stories. And I think a lot of, if that person, again, going back to this person who felt deceived um, by the structure of it, um, that's all me. That was just me being like, what's the but best way it, we can tell, we tell the story, the story as But we I go think along. it helped people to get right. from episode to episode and yeah. then really understand what that episode was about, yeah. uh, was about because it left it on that what if, and that was exactly what our story was. Yeah. It was when you left it, that's how we were feeling. So anyways, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to- We could go on about this subject for, for many hours. Well, no, but I think, you know, I think the the main like big picture takeaway, at least for me, in hearing any sort of criticism of the podcast is just like I promise you guys that we are two people who like just really wanted to do something good and we tried our best. What's funny though, Todd, is this makes me not giggle a little bit, but it does. Just the fact that I think, you know, you the feedback has been, I've never had feedback like this. Obviously it's so meaningful, just the connections, but I lived a life where I was a, an athlete and then now a broadcaster and just in the public eye. And most of my life has just been negative <laughs> trolls and people. So this, it's just funny seeing the difference. Cause I think you saw literally he saw just one comment on apple podcast and 399 <laughs> were these yeah. amazing comments and there's been like one other comment so for me also i'm sorry to interrupt you on on podcast which we haven't done again i like you know like Todd loves year, the comments, so comment no, on well, the podcast. I was going to say like a year ago or a year and a half ago, I was reading about like, what do you, how do you start a podcast? And I watch a bunch of internet videos and they're like, you have to say subscribe after like yeah. subscribe, comment on Apple, <laughs> like all these things, which we never did. Yeah. So now go, go to Apple, Apple and, and comment. comment and subscribe, please. Retroactively subscribe no, and comment. but what's so funny is there's been like these two comments and I just feel like you haven't been in the public eye. So this is just an interesting new world for you. Like, yeah, but it's okay. That's nothing like two no, comments. Well, it's easy like, for me. Welcome to my other life. I know. Well, it's easy for me <laughs> because like they're all direct, like directed at you, but I feel yeah. this like, Oh no. Well, we had talked about too, during like skating, like this was years ago. Yeah. I feel like when you and Johnny are on, on air, there'll be oh, some trolls. It's so cute. Todd and I wanted to so start, upset. well, I was going to start a, what do they call this? Like burner a, Twitter account yes. and just respond to everyone and just roast people so I, hard. I would laugh and I never so did hard. It. You should do it. It's hilarious. <laughs> the comments he sends me of what he'd send people, you would really enjoy. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but the feedback is so great. And just a few. And again, I want to, I, I keep saying it because again, we're prefacing because we're annoying. Because we're preface. Now I'm a, I'm a preface but I do, queen. I do understand you. some. I do understand the like listening to this and being like, oh, they got a baby. I, I want to relate and they got a baby. And I, I feel I, we, we do feel guilty. Yeah. Well, that, I, you know? I deal with that. I mean, for me, it's not from the, the two comments, but it's more, you know, I think it's hard for me to forget 
who I was for five years and feel so connected to that world and then have the thing that I, I saw everyone else have and want so badly and not, it's like survivor's guilt and not feel, um, you know, not feel that guilt. Well, the other thing to point out, which I was going to ask you this anyway, but it relates to this is if there is any criticism of like, oh, Tara needs to like drop her life <laughs> and like become an infertility specialist and, you know, donate 99% yeah. of her, you know, salary to the infertility cause. People, I don't think, think about the fact that you do get thousands of messages. You respond to as many as you can. I think m mostly yes. all of them. But also the the tr traumatic effect that your journey has on even like going back and engaging with these women. Like it's not that easy. Like it's easy to be like, oh, engage everyone. And you told this story. Now it's time to like make a difference in the community. Right. That's hard. It's hard for you. Like I see you at night <laughs> reading all these things. I do crying. it usually late at night. And then I think even for me, not to make this about me, but we will. Uh, <laughs> even for me, like laying next to you in bed, you'll like read me a story. And it it makes me kind of feel sometimes like it, it puts me emotion. back. It puts yeah. me back like three years ago and thinking like, oh, man, like these people are where we were. And it's it, hard. It gets it's a lot me of into, like I get an anxious, anxious when sometimes you're telling me these things. So it's not the easiest thing to just like, you know have some success and then go back and, and dedicate yourself to right, it's dredging hard. up these feelings. It, yeah, there's there's a lot of emotions that go along with it. And I think the more time, and it hasn't been that long, I mean, just weeks really, but I, I realize now infertility will stay with me probably my whole life. You know, it was a diagnosis. It is a diagnosis. I have endometriosis. I've experienced a lot of loss and and grief. And I think that hopefully I'm healing and evolving, but it's going to stay. I realize that it's going to stay with me. Um, but I like focusing all of my energy and what I can do and what I, I love trying to help. I mean, I am cold calling people. I just did a, I, I got um, Sunfish, which I learned about what they do, which is incredible. But I also was able to have a $10,000 giveaway um, to anyone who was in need of fertility treatment. I, I worked with um, Hope for Fertility, which is an, I mean, they are incredible. They are giving away money um, to people that are in need of fertility treatment. And I, I did this, I spent the night, it was just this Friday, and I was, I didn't think it was going to affect me as much as it did, but I was on the Zoom telling six couples the money that they, with Hope for Fertility, because we did this thing through my Instagram to to promote this grant that they were giving out. And we, one of the couples found it through us on Instagram. And I got on the Zoom and was like, hi guys, they think that they're on a call with Hope for Fertility, just again, sort of selling their story in hopes for getting this grant. So even one person was like, oh, we had all our bills laid out here. And, you know, they didn't realize that it was actually the call to let them know they're receiving $10,000 for their next cycle or, or whatever it was. And I, I've done a lot of things on air, on TV. I have to keep it together. I didn't realize I cried up in this kitchen bald. Like, I actually had to turn off the camera at one point because I was n not able to talk because it was that even now I'm going to get upset because it was, you know, you hear these people's stories. I've been there and I know, you know, how much that means to them. And I kept connected with this one couple where we talked a little bit during it and, and she listened to the podcast and her husband hadn't listened to the podcast, but was saying like, she has a new friend in you. She, this has changed our relationship. And and it was like, oh my God, don't even talk about me. Like, what are you going through? But just to be part of the community, be part of this, it's just, um, it's so fulfilling in my life. But it is, you know, a world that is filled with sadness for so many people and you're in it, you know, and you have to feel those emotions. But while we're talking about this, I'm going to, because we can plug everything we want here. <laughs> Plug I'm it. gonna just plug away. I'm gonna talk about Baby Quest because I again cold called Baby Quest and was like, "Hey, 
I need to do, we need to do something in this community together. Like what you're doing is incredible. How do I get involved? I became an ambassador. We're now putting together this next fertility grant that's coming up in March. So I'm going to be, if anyone listening, I'm going to be doing much more on my Instagram shortly where we are um, going to be, you know, hopefully getting donations for the grant. There's already so much money in the grant. So I'll explain to everyone how they can apply for this specific grant. But um, baby quest, guys, I'm going to talk about this soon. So you got to get on board. And even if you can donate $1, um, it will add up and it will make a difference. So to Todd's point, subscribe to the podcast, comment on the podcast, follow our YouTube and give a dollar to um, Baby Quest once Positive I put that up. Positive comments only. <laughs> yeah, he can't handle the negative. There ones. was also, oh God, I shouldn't dwell on this because I'll get made fun of. Um, I saw another comment. That it's actually 100% true. And now on this podcast, I'm trying to be cognizant of it. I what? know I have it. It's just the way I talk. What? And it's like, oh my God, I just did it. What? Someone was like, you say like every other word and it's distracting. And so oh. now subconsciously I'm oh, thinking okay, about Todd. it. No, I do though. Way, way, way more than you. Cause on the last podcast, I took note of it. Oh. I say like, like a thousand times. Like I'm a Valley girl. <laughs> I'm like a fairly well-educated <laughs> person. It's hard, but you know what's so hard is we're, we're talking about difficult subjects. We're like digging deep for emotions. Yeah. That's no excuse. Come on. Well, I say like while we're, I'll just give you this. I cannot say like ever. I don't think I've said right. like ever on my sports broadcasting. You cannot say like. I say like here because it's but casual it, and fun. I know, but when you do it, it's it's not as bad. Okay, well, you'll be okay. We'll work on this together. So count my <laughs> likes on this one and, and yeah. let me know. I think my like, no, my number will drop as we keep going. So I'm going to be cognizant of it. I'm going to try to it. take a you deep breath. It, and, you know, you I just it. get very excited when we're talking. <laughs> and, you know, when you're pulling words, you yes. just use these filler words. It's hard. I used to say, you know, a lot. When I was yeah, like know, doing interviews and stuff, yeah. I got comments online when I was doing like some Rodman interviews. Really? Of, this guy says, you know, every other word. I can't even listen to him. Like, Aww. Gosh. You know, you it's know, hard I'll, out there. It is. I'm, I don't envy your job having to endure <laughs> this on a weekly basis. Well, that's why this is so amazing. I'm just, I'm just connecting with people that are just so, I, because I've been in the public eye and I get all these trolls usually. I just like, it's like a new world. I'm like, there's so many nice people out there. Who knew? Yeah. People <laughs> are, it is interesting. Like, oh my God, do you hear me? No. It is interesting. Like, oh my whenever goodness, TK. I use it as like a conjunction, it's, I'm like a attaching sentences with this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is interesting though that, <laughs> now I can't, I'm overthinking everything I'm saying now. Oh my goodness. It is interesting, though, going through this process, you do realize how awesome so many people are and caring and kind and compassionate and empathetic. Yes. You go through life sometimes and feel like everyone is out to get you or mean or angry or leaving bad comments, but it's not just here. not true. Not in this I mean, world. even on this podcast, we're making it seem like, I mean, there were literally three or four bad comments out of thousands on all three. platforms. <laughs> yeah. So we were so lucky and people out there are so awesome and yeah. nice and complimentary and they know I don't do this for a living. That's why I say like all the time. <laughs> so leave me alone. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, people have been so awesome. Um, one other thing connected to what you were saying before about like identifying with like this group so much. I mean, is this your like number one kind of identity I mean, in life, I think we go through things and then we become part of groups. That's just about I mean, right. it's like sociology, I'm sure. Like right. you go through something traumatic and then you connect with those people or your culture, race, like all that stuff. Right. You feel bonded to a certain group of people. And I know your identity for so long was skating and obviously still is. But is this now kind of trumped the skating identity, do you think? They I just, mean, it's really hard. I mean, I don't know myself without skates or an ice rink. You know, that started at three years old and I'm 41 and it's still, you know, I'm a, a figure skating analyst. It's it's my life. Um, so that's a huge part of my identity. I would say this is this is especially because our life changed so dramatically, uh, so quickly and for five long years 
Um, it is hard to know who I am without infertility, right? And it's also confusing because infertility is a diagnosis. And as we start our second journey, it's part of our life. And, you know, endometriosis and all of these things are medical diagnosis, you know, you get a medical diagnosis for. So it is part of you. Um, but it's something that that's why I'm excited for us to do it in our own way as we move forward of keeping infertility and keeping ourselves in this community and sharing stories and helping and advocating and doing whatever we can um, while still, you know, enjoying the fact that we do have a child. And, and, and obviously you have to navigate those feelings. And I always want to be so sensitive because we have graduated to this, you know, we talked about it in the podcast, it's like video game levels. And we we would go further one time and our pregnancy would last a little bit longer and then it won in. And then, you know, we do have a child now. So, you know, it is it is interesting because I connect much more to that person who is going through a retrieval or going into a transfer or experiencing pregnancy loss than I probably would, you know someone else who hasn't, who has a child. Or just, I think, from observing you for these weeks with Georgie and just like your internet uh -huh. searching and being on Instagram and, you know, I, I just see your habits. Right. It feels like even still, you know, 95% of the things that you talk about or are looking at are infertility things versus parenting, which is interesting. It's you, you almost haven't really, obviously we're great parents and invested right. in Georgie and are with her every second and all that and care about her and are doing research. But it still does feel like, like I don't see you on a bunch of mommy no, parenting nothing, things, nothing. you know, or like What's researching so that funny, stuff. You you don't really seem to connect with those. And I don't connect. I don't connect at all. Yeah, and I don't mean that as a bad thing. No, and to be honest, I've actually that. made that choice where I don't. You know, I went so deep because we had to. Our our case was so dire. I had to research. I had to advocate. I had to put myself in these deep, dark forums and drive myself crazy because I felt like I, I needed to be that person for us to further our journey. Whereas right now as a parent, you know, knock on wood, I could be, you know, in that parenthood mindset and researching everything and looking up. I, I don't want to ever go there again. Like I want to try to live in the moment and not ever go down that road again. And I'm sure you notice it. Sometimes I'll be like, what is it? When, when should she do, like, when should she start sucking her thumb? I'll be like, Todd, can you Google it? Because I won't go near Google because I, I, I have such PTSD from Googling. And I do feel like I'm still so, so invested in the infertility world. You know, even I read reports and I, <laughs> I'm like a nerd. I... I feel like I've learned so much. I can't just stop now. And I think also I know we're about to start our second journey and all of those emotions are coming up. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think the, the intensity of, <laughs> no, but seriously, like the intensity at, of which you operated for like the last five years hit a level that wasn't sustainable just in terms of the no. research and the worrying and, yes. and all of it. It couldn't sustain. It doesn't. It also didn't need to. Like Georgie is healthy. Right. And we haven't had you know major issues. But I, I do think again, you're kind of this person now who's, you know, when we order like a stroller or one of these like baby toys or whatever in the past, like with fertility and whatever the equivalent right. of that would be, you would scrutinize the scrutiny at which you made all these decisions and thought about things was so high. Um, and that doesn't happen now because I just don't think you actually can. Right. You can't. You can't. And also because it didn't need to. What's so sad for us is we had to go that deep. That's what we had to do to to hope for some, you know, bright light. And now, you know, it's just it, it is definitely different. <laughs> well, you mentioned the second potential journey, which just even saying that kind of gets me a little anxious. But Thinking about the second journey, what do you feel like? I guess the first question before I Ooh. ask the feeling is, is there a chance? I actually, what's so sad is we live together every day. I don't know the, I don't know the answer to this, which I should. But, I mean, do you want to ever try to carry? 
Oh, I love how we're having this right now. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I really have, they're just like polar opposite feelings and I don't know what to do with them. And it's funny you say this because I was going to ask my therapist. I mean, the good news is, is we have embryos on ice and I, I want a big family. So I feel, I don't feel the pressure that the second journey would have to be me. Maybe it could be the third or maybe never at all or the fourth or whatever we want to do. I, your eyes are probably going to widen when I say four children. Um, we're not doing four children. Yes, we are. <laughs> we are. <laughs> Let's. We have this now documented. <laughs> I shouldn't have brought this up on a podcast. <laughs> um, You're going to see my cheeks starting to get red and steam coming out of my ears. But I, I don't know. I don't know because I'm so traumatized by pregnancy. I'm terrified of being pregnant. It has become a fear of mine. I don't want to go through a miscarriage. I also don't want to be pregnant and think, is there another problem we didn't? I mean, I had every problem in the book. Is there another problem we wouldn't know about until I'm 20 something weeks? Does Did my endometriosis or slight, like whatever it is in there that's that I had a surgery for, would I need to do another surgery right away before trying? Because what happens if, could that affect it? Like, I don't even know the issues that could occur in my body, but since everything happened to me, I'm afraid that I would jeopardize our pregnancy again. Um, there's a part of me that's like, would that be another triumph for me to actually carry a successful pregnancy or does it really matter anymore? Like this last uh, surrogacy, it definitely didn't matter. When I look at I know how badly I, I wanted it. I think you it. don't think it matters. I mean, the, what matters, as we've talked about, is the the child right. being there. So the then I get born. confused. Do I yeah. want to do it or not? Like I am, like we're talking about it here. I'm not giving you a good answer. I have no idea what I feel. <laughs> I think that. Well, let me put words in your mouth. But what do you think? I don't know. I think ultimately you won't try, and I Why? think I would even urge you. Again, weird. We're doing this on the podcast, but I guess I would urge you not to because. Just, That's interesting to hear from your perspective. But maybe perspective. this is also, again, trying to admit this, but being selfish of the idea of like re-entering the world of you doing all these things that felt like now they it feels like that's the past, like getting pregnant again, going to the heartbeat scan, you know, especially if you do this IVIG thing or whatever it is that we do to try to combat whatever issue we had. There's a pers another percentage chance it just helps the percentages. So you could still have another miscarriage. You could still, we could right. lose embryos. And just even thinking about the office and going there with you and leaving and so being you upset. Ha you have, I think this is so interesting, Todd, because I think you, that you're describing, you know, grief and PTSD yourself. That's what it is. Yeah. It's thinking about going to the same place. It's it's all of those things. It's and it's interesting. I have two points here about the IVIG and then you know, your perspective because I got a message recently where someone really probably well, she says her doctor feels that surrogacy is the option and she's obviously the financial cost, but she's like just who I am as a person seems hard that that would be hard to do and then you know, thinking about how my husband feels about surrogacy. And we never really talked about this, but I remember I had a comment by someone once was like, my husband would never let me do surrogacy. And it made me so sad. And it made me sad for me because I, but I know you so well, and I know our experience, you know, it made me sad for people out there that judge surrogacy in that way to then that is making that person, that woman or me, which it didn't, but who cares, like feel shame um, that their husband or partner is missing out on a pregnancy experience when this is about a medical diagnosis. Like think about if someone has a different illness and your your partner <laughs> says, well, would we would never be able to do this or that. And And I don't know, it's just interesting to hear you. And I think this might help a lot of people out there and women out there that worry about their partner, disappointing their partners through this choice. And it makes me so happy to hear that you didn't just say like, yes, I wish we could have this experience together. I wish you do that. And I think it just goes to show when you go through fucking hell mm -hmm. that 
your outlook changes. Yeah, you're just balancing the good. Like, would I love to see you with a belly? Like, right. we've talked about this ad nauseum on the podcast yeah. about things that used to matter that yeah. don't anymore. Like, sure, like it'd be fun right. to see you pregnant. Like, right. and hold your hand while you're right. giving birth. Right. But our experience having Georgie was really cool in its right. own way. And again, thinking about you getting a heartbeat scan and the potential or you, aftermath. Like you said, yeah. going to that office. Yeah, I think that outweighs. The, the belly. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I think for me too, the IVIG, just wanted to point that out. It was interesting. I told you that I got a message from someone who was thinking about, sur uh, about trying again before surrogacy. And she said she went to a doctor who said, you know, they didn't suggest, you know, they wouldn't recommend IVIG for them and, and kind of gave me this interesting article and this woman who died from IVIG treatments. And again, I was so crazy in our journey. I would have tried anything, taken any drug, but now I'm at the point where I'm like, do I really want to put my body through these infusions of IVIG if I don't need to? And again, that is a one-off thing. IVIG is safe and it is, um, you know, many people do it. Um, but you know, it's a personal choice if I – do I want to add another variable into the mix of my life? Yeah. So that's my answer. Yeah, I mean the last <laughs> thing too to talk about with the like second or third or whatever, you know, journey we go on is for me there's like a weird dichotomy about, okay, we have Georgie. We went through this, you know, really long process and infertility journey. I don't want to jump back into that right away. But then on the other, on the flip side of it, I kind of want to get all, like, if we're going to have two or three kids, like, let's just get it all out of the yes. way. Because there's going to be, like, or if four. we, if we, do, <laughs> if we do surrogacy, <laughs> it's the, that process, which isn't the most fun right. of like finding or selecting, or even if you try to go right. through one, like, like I just discussed, right. like those appointments, like I do have this small amount of PTSD from right. just that process. So on one hand, it's, I don't want to do it and revisit those feelings. But on the other, it's, what if we just, by the time I'm, you know, two years from now, right. we have our whole family and I just never have to think about yes. any of this again. Yeah, so I, I don't, don't know which one is the right answer. I want to go right away. I don't want to think about it. I mean, there's also the part of me that just, we lost so many embryos. I had to do so many retrievals. Again, yes, we were so lucky and blessed that this, that our embryo worked the first time in a surrogate, but that's not always the case. And there, there are, I mean, it really is just a 60% chance on anybody, on a surrogate, on anyone. So there's a chance we're going to fail again. There's a chance we're going to lose an embryo. And we're really lucky that we have a good amount of embryos of our embryos on ice because especially that last retrieval we did so well, like we, we have that, but there's still this fear because how many embryos did we lose the first try? So I just want to get it done. I just want to, and you know, what's interesting is like, I think about our surrogacy journey with Michaela and I have this connection to Michaela, right? This is an amazing connection <laughs> that I have with her. And that's the beautiful part of what I remember. The pregnancy part scares me still. I'm like not really looking forward to nine months of those feelings that I had of what, what is this scan going to be? What is going to go wrong? I just, I didn't breathe. I took my first exhale as Georgie was screaming and, you know, in the hospital. And I just know that those nine months, 10 months, it's going to be, you know, that anxiety again. Yeah. We should point out, though, that these are good dilemmas, I think, to have. The fact that we had a child and oh my goodness, talking about two or three or four, it's like that almost feels like we won the lottery with even being able to have these discussions now. Well, it's, it's true. And it's like I think that's another thing to even point out here and we always preface is that we have the ability to do a second surrogacy. Um, and whether w if we have four, if that means maybe I have to, I have to try to take one of my own at that point. But, um, we are lucky that we have embryos right now. That doesn't mean though they could all go away, but we are lucky that we're able even to continue. And that's what kills me of, and why I'm working so hard. Cause there's so many families out there that are just hoping for one to work um, so these are all good dilemmas to have, but like you said, it doesn't take away 
the grief and feelings of anxiety and PT- PTSD that we we both have. But I, I mean, it's so funny. As you say this, I want to make it clear to everyone out there as we talk about the future of building a family, even though it's sort of, we should be able to talk about, oh, we, we want a big family. I think that's okay to say, but it's not lost on me for all those women that are waiting for that first one because I was there too. I mean, to be honest, I just thought we're, we're never having any child. So, you know, I want us to always acknowledge all the people out there, even when we say these things of we want a big family, like I see and I hear you and I know you're you're just hoping that one of these transfers works. Um, and I know that feeling. And I'm sure we'll probably update people as the podcast goes along on these decisions and what we decide to do. And who knows if we'll document it in the same way as we did the first time around, but you know. Yeah, we'll- it'll be interesting that I think about a lot too. Like what will I be able to, I mean, we were able to document this first one in, in as much real time as possible, but we were doing, no one knew about the podcast yet. We were doing it in our basement. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what we can handle. And it is interesting. Sometimes I think do well, I don't want to say this to you because I want you to think that I want to (laughs) like go as like go on the journey as long as possible or, you know, you know me, I wasn't ever going to stop in that moment until I felt that I wanted to stop, but which I love you. So I appreciate you like stepping up and just continuing on that journey. But there's a part of me that's sometimes scared too to start a second one because I'm, I'm, I know all the things that can go wrong. One of them is if we have another miscarriage or ones if we lost a baby deep into the pregnancy or ones if we exp- experience child or stillbirth, then I wonder, do I even try? Do we even, do we just say, oh my gosh, we got so lucky with Georgie. We just stop here. I don't ever want to experience more, but I don't know. How do you feel about that? It's worth the risk. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that does scare me. I mean, we could lose two straight embryos or three embryos on a surrogate. I mean, right right away. So I mean, for me, it's even more so. I mean, the embryo loss is is devastating, but I I think miscarriage for me has been so hard. I'm terrified of the pregnancy. I would be curious to to know from people in the community and who don't have a not that who don't have a child, who have one child like it just seems like. Is the trauma not as not that it's not as bad as there's secondary infertility, but the pressure I feel like, I guess this is what I'm saying. I know I'm rambling on and feel free to keep counting my likes. (laughs) Um, But I would think that we have one child, the the devastation of never having either a biological child or kind of starting your own family in the way that you want to is a a grieving process that you have to go through. If we then try a bunch of things for child two and it doesn't work, I think it's hard to make the argument that it would be the same feeling of loss. Okay. So I have your answer for you from being in this community for so long and watching everyone's stories. I can't give you firsthand advice until we would ever have, you know, hopefully we don't, but if we experience that, but, um, secondary infertility or people that are even trying, I I connected with one woman who's trying for third child and has gone through, you know, a few miscarriages. I don't think it matters. I don't, I I don't think it matters. It's something you want deeply. It's potential human life. It, it doesn't matter. And I think there's probably so many people on here that have secondary infertility or are, you know, maybe it's the third child that they want. I, I think the feelings are exactly the same because I see them, I hear them, I watch their stories and the pain is exactly but the what same would you as guess, mine. What would you guess for yourself, though? Because I just think you were so terrified of never having a child. Yes, so the I, fact that you we have Georgie, if we try two or three embryos and a surrogate and it doesn't no, work and we, and we have a conversation yeah. with each other, like, do we want to keep going through this? Like, let's we have Georgie. Let's move on. I don't think you'd be as devastated if we were like, we're, we're just not going to have kids I, I and have a different know. kind of life. Yeah, I don't know. I just think it's interesting because I had a friend who had I'm her, also not trying to like diminish no, people no, who are going not. through no. secondary It's just interesting to think about. It's yeah. interesting to think about. And when I first start, struggled with infertility, I thought that. I thought if I just get one, then all the pressure is off. Um, but I have had a friend who had one and then went through years 
um, lost a baby far into her pregnancy. And I've seen her, her anxiety levels. I've seen the pain for this second child. And um, I think, and she always says, I'm just so blessed to have the first one. So I don't think that's ever lost on anyone. You feel so blessed to have that. But I just think it's almost like the game starts again yeah. and you feel those same feelings. But I, I guess, um, I guess I, you know what I'm saying is what, what I was just going to say is like, I just hope that, you know, we don't have to experience that, but yeah. I know very well this, who knows yeah. what we're in, what's in store for us. Yeah. It's also, we've said this so much on the podcast. It's not that insightful, but I'll say it again. Just the idea that no human being knows what's in store for them. For anything. For anything. Right. So like knock on wood, or I don't want to put this out in the world, I could get some terrible diagnosis right. in a year or right. something could be wrong with Georgie. Like, you know, yeah, anything can happen in life, I yeah. guess is what I'm saying. So like we hit some really bad luck for right. many, many years with fertility. And let's just hope that nothing similar, we don't have to go through a similar journey yeah. with this or something else. Yeah. Um, that's just life, I guess, though. It is life. You know, you have family members who are going through tough medical, yeah, you know, know, cancer diagnoses yes. and all this stuff. Yeah. So it's, yeah. as we've said, life is is hard. Right. You know, adulting is just hard and tiring. <laughs> it is. But thank God for fucking Chardonnay, guys. I was just going to say, thank God for wine and, <laughs> is it, when and we're double done IPAs. This, it's, it's a Sunday. Are we, are we ready for I've got some... a uh, double IPA can in the uh Okay, I got some fridge Chardonnay in me. there. The last thing I wanted to ask you is... You know, this was sort of just us talking about some issues in infertility and infertility, but we are going to transition. Hopefully, maybe not. It's every, maybe it's not every week, but hopefully, most weeks where we're going to bring on some people who have incredible, heartbreaking, triumphant, all of the things um, stories um, onto the podcast. So, if, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little more about kind of where we're maybe headed. Yeah, I think you know we we both want to spread even more awareness. And our story is just one story, but there's so many different stories out there um, and different people and couples and, um, you know, experiences that weren't part of our story, whether it's stillbirth or donor eggs or, I mean, there's a, there's a million, I'm not going to list them all. <laughs> um, but I have run into, you know, many people that I think would be able to share their story and have our listeners connect to their unique journey. And we don't know how exactly we're going to lay it out. Will it just be one episode or will there be a cliffhanger to the next episode? No, no more cliffhangers. <laughs> yeah. No, we definitely have to do the cliffhangers. <laughs> that makes the storytelling um, impactful. But I think that um, – I'm really excited about this and we've already started diving into maybe one or two people that we're going to have on and we're, we're thinking maybe next week, but we're not going to throw that out there quite yet just until we have it, you know, down and in the books. Yeah. But I, I think it's going to be nice to connect with other people and their journeys. And there are so many, I mean, just cra crazy is the word to to connect with these women or couples and hear them tell me their story. I'm just like, damn, infertility just sucks. Yeah. You know, before we go, <laughs> you're going to be really upset by this. What? But because you, you think, I, and I don't do it necessarily. I bring up like a very small thing and then you blow it up into something bigger, but like, like my what? fashion stuff. Your wardrobe, so, but people no, 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 are but, talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> no one's talking about it. They are trying to look at the messages. No you know how you it. feel about messages. So mid podcast, like this podcast, I thought about another funny thing about my wardrobe what? that people don't know. So again, I, I shouldn't keep saying, oh, I'm from the Midwest. Like it makes you me are, feel though. like a hillbilly with no fashion sense or whatever. But tailoring. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go I, with your pants. So I've only been to the tailor like <laughs> once in my entire life, which is so like I have friends who were on a group chat. We always make make there's a couple guys on there that get everything tailored and they like make fun of the other guys who like literally have never tailored anything in their life. But I just want to point out, I know many people are just listening, but 
so 90% of my jeans, you know how jeans are when you buy like nicer jeans, they make them really long. Yeah. And they expect you to get them tailored. Like you're going to pay this amount of money for a nice pair of jeans. Like you're going to pay the $15 to like, or whatever, you know, I wouldn't know what it costs because I don't go to tailor, but in LA it's probably more than that. But so what I end up doing, and you can't see it, but I'm wearing these now. You roll them under. I roll them on like every single pair of my jeans. There's like, uh, probably like five inches of denim that's just like rolled up the other way so it kind of looks like it's tailored Todd, but it's this not. isn't a, i just want to bring but this up that just a little this. insight into our marriage this isn't a tailoring wardrobe problem this is you put certain things on the back burner for years i've been I go to the tailor and I'm. This isn't a back yeah, burner. Let, this is I just a back don't want to go. Like, no, you don't want to go. What do you do? Does this look okay? Is like no, a it tailored doesn't. Pant leg? No, it does not. It doesn't. It doesn't. It looks like it's rolled under. It, well, you don't have a hem of any sort. <laughs> so no, but you can be another next thing. thing I you're going to do is tape it. They, uh, if you go to a tailor, it'll be cheaper if you don't keep the hem. I, I so understand. I'm not keeping a hem. Uh, well, that's a lo- that's a huge luxury. Todd, where I'm from, guys. So it's more that when I say, "Hey, I, it's a Saturday. I'm going to the tailor. Would you like to?" C- no, I'll do that next time. Would, <laughs> would you want to just pin them and I'll take them yeah, for I'm you? I'm just saying no. that because I'm also, not going to do guys, it. And I don't want to. Where's your left hand? You want to just show the camera your left hand? You would yeah. never even know he's married. <laughs> okay, guys. That's for another pie. It, you would never know. It's all know. pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, but he doesn't wear his wedding ring most of the time because he needs to get it resized. But it's only it's been so painful to wear. <laughs> how many years that you just have to drive? I know. 10 minutes away and do it. It's like it's expensive though to get like a nice Todd. ring resize. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're really into the expenses this episode. No, I just my I, it, it, I've guys, worn can these you leave pants. him some messages that he needs to go get his ring um uh, resized? I always wonder this though, like while we're doing the podcast, especially like the first iteration in the basement, yeah. where if anyone noticed that my pants were just rolled up, I don't think they were looking. No, no, okay, All right. well. <laughs> Maybe in the next episode I'll have a nice tailored pant yeah. to show off. You'll be good. All right. That's a wrap on 17. That's a wrap. I love you. Love you too. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Unexpecting the Podcast. Please subscribe, leave a review, and follow Unexpecting Pod on Instagram for info about upcoming weekly episode releases.